Tech Trends is an original podcast series that dives into topics like quantum computing, 5G, tech for social good, and design thinking. Our conversations touch on how tech can transform the way businesses deliver for their customers, clients, and communities. For more information, visit jpmorganchase.com slash technology. This is MIT Technology Review. Yes, yes. I'm just going from place to place now looking for for internet. Roman Tarasevich runs a 5,000 acre farm in the Ukrainian region of Zaporizhia. I have three children. My eldest son, it's from his phone that I talk. He's already married, and thankfully, I'm a grandfather. So we sent them all to Poland. He and his son stayed behind and ran the farm after the invasion, until late June, when his family came back home. Then, Zaporizhia came under massive attack of S-300 missiles. This is generally an anti-aircraft weapon. Here in our neighborhood, in a nine-story building, one entryway was completely demolished. It was there, then it was gone. And last week, one landed nearby. Thank God everyone is in one piece. Everyone is healthy. Next to the warehouse, the equipment was banged up. The warehouse was damaged. Well, what to do? You know, we are already adapting to these rails, and we live. And through it all, he continues to farm, as he's done the past 20 years. Though he says it's getting much harder to work in the way he knows he should to be most effective, as supplies decline, expenses mount, and exports are at a standstill. And yet, this year he managed to grow wheat, barley, corn, sunflower, and canola. Rockets break shrapnel in our fields. We have repeatedly, unfortunately, burst tires on combines because it cuts, punctures everything. The threat is always there, but well, what to do? I have 60 people working at my company all the time. And on top of that, 500 shareholders from whom I rent land. If I were to take my family and go to Europe or somewhere else, what will these people do? Much of the agricultural land in his region is occupied, and he believes many of those farms' harvests have been looted. His land isn't occupied, and for now, his harvest is safe. But beyond what he sells locally, it's been impossible to move his crops. There's no point in hauling anything with the cost of diesel, of everything. We just cannot. So we have it all lying in warehouses now. That is, the harvest for 2021 and 2022. And it's almost all in warehouses. I'm Jennifer Strong. In this episode, we explore how the war in Ukraine is changing what it means to farm one of the world's key bread baskets where shortages of everything from seeds to fertilizer might accelerate the adoption of technologies that can help those supplies go further. And we look at AI-powered maps, created with years of Ukrainian data that are helping the sector plan and estimate yields. I have to be here. That's all. This is my land, my home, everything. Everything is here. Let's go. In Machines We Trust. I'm listening. A podcast about the automation of everything. You have reached your destination. Many people probably think about NASA and they think about space exploration, they think about astronauts, they probably don't usually think about agriculture, but actually the earliest satellites were designed with agricultural monitoring as one of the key applications. My name is Inbal becker Reshef. I'm the director of NASA Harvest, which is NASA's food security and agriculture program. 
It uses satellite data to better understand the world's agricultural fields, like the impact a drought might have on nearby crops. We have a lot of satellites that are passing over us all the time and collecting a lot of information about the Earth's surface, about the air above it, in wavelengths both that we can see, the visible wavelengths, as well as many other wavelengths that our human eye can't see but actually provide a lot of information. Fun fact, they receive data from the entire surface of the Earth, including every agricultural field on the planet, each and every day. And that helps us to monitor both how a specific agricultural season might be developing and how a crop is growing and changing through that season, but it also helps us to look at how things have changed between one season to the next, how land cover and land use have changed. It can help them study the impact of global warming. It can also help them understand how crops are doing in a war zone. Ukraine is a major breadbasket of the world. It, it is a major producer and exporter of wheat. Around 10% of global exports prior to the war came out of Ukraine. Countries like Lebanon, over 80% of their wheat came from Ukraine prior to the war. The World Food Program, I think around 40% of their wheat that goes into food aid comes out of Ukraine. The country also exports about 40% of the world's sunflower oil and is a major producer of corn. In other words, Ukraine is really important to the global food supply. And so long before the war, we'd actually worked a lot on monitoring agriculture in Ukraine and using satellites to map the croplands, right? So where is wheat growing versus sunflowers? And to also be able to forecast what the ultimate yields would be. And so we had quite established relationships with different entities in Ukraine. And when the war broke out, we were in contact with their Ministry of Agriculture and forged a partnership with them to help to support their analysis. And particularly what they asked us to focus on was the occupied territories, where they couldn't get ground information and ground data. And it was really important to be able to understand what's happening in those territories. This year's wheat crop was planted last fall, before the war started. And they were trying to figure out how much of that wheat would be able to be harvested, especially inside occupied regions. And so our first maps we released in, in April, and one of the first things we could do is say, well, Russia actually was occupying around 23% of Ukraine's total croplands and around 29% of the planted area to wheat. And there were a lot of different estimates ranging anywhere between 30% to 50% in the occupied territories that would not be able to be harvested because farmers abandoned those fields, because they've been shelled and bombed, because machinery has been destroyed. She continued to follow these crops on through harvest time, and we'll hear more from her in just a bit. Meanwhile, ag tech companies working in Ukraine are also using satellites to watch these fields. My name is Morten Schmidt. I'm the CEO of OneSoil. I make data and information about what is growing and how healthy is it. And I do it by combining satellite imagery with machine learning and actual data from fields to create products that can predict or diagnose real-time what is going on in the fields. It's a Swiss company that originated in Belarus and is now based in Poland, and its data products are used by farmers as well as industry players. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Now you should see my screen. He's showing me a map that visualizes this data. It recognizes what's growing and predicts what the yields might be. And here we are detecting 13 crops. And if we just do a quick zoom here on, uh, this is Indiana, you can see this very nice, colorful picture. This is, of course, a visualization that the, the real value behind here is the use of the data. If I go to my Ukraine map here, this is what grows in Ukraine now. So basically, this is a detection from beginning of August. If I zoom in here, you can see that Ukraine fields, they are different color because there are different crops than in Indiana. Uh, here is much more sunflower. You don't have that there. This tool can be used to look back at the last six years. And he says it has very good data about Ukraine because that's basically what helped him build it. And now he's using that data to try to figure out the impact of the war on specific crops. And the map that I'm showing you right now is exactly that analysis. So here we took corn and sunflower, which are two of the largest agricultural industrial crops in Ukraine. And we looked at each region and we compared it with last year's acreage. And you can see in, the, in these eastern regions, we are at you know, a significant reduction in these crops, which are the core industrial crops, but also the summer crops. 
Usually when we have these conversations about precision farming, or using data and technology to maximize crops and minimize waste, we're talking about how these practices reduce pollution and are good for the planet, as well as farmers' bottom line. But here, we're talking about a war-torn nation that's also a global breadbasket. And since the invasion, the most basic of farming supplies have been hard to come by. And that scarcity? It might actually be leading to quicker uptake of these precision tools, fueled by data and AI. There is less fertilizer, there is less seeds, there is less chemicals. So that meant that these technologies that have been available and were used to some extent have been accelerated because they help them get the maximum output of the scarce resources they have. He shows me how it works. You can see the productivity map that we detected on the, on the right side. And on the left side, you can see the actual measured map from the combine. And that allows us to help the customer to make his planting map or his fertilizer map that he then loads into his tractor and allows him to do this variable planting and fertilization or chemical application of the field. You can find links to our reporting in the show notes, and you can support our journalism by going to techreview.com slash subscribe. We'll be back right after this. Tech Trends is an original podcast series that dives into topics like quantum computing, 5G, tech for social good, and design thinking. Our conversations touch on how tech can transform the way businesses deliver for their customers, clients, and communities. For more information, visit jpmorganchase.com slash technology. Okay, my name is Alexei Misura. I'm head of R&D department of IMC. I'm see it's like a top 10 Ukrainian agri holdings. Uh, we are doing mostly cash crops, corn, winter wheat, sunflower. He's been working with OneSoil for the last three years, providing data from their lands and testing their products, among many others. I'm searching for new technologies in growing crops and I'm testing it. Perhaps I was planning to go more in production, in management, but to try something new, it's, I think it's more fun. Of the projects he's working on, he says he's most excited about the maps we heard about just before the break, where crops can be monitored down to the individual seed. And you can see it online. You can, uh, you have an iPad in a tractor connected to the monitor of the planter. And uh, basically you can sit at home and you can see on uh, your personal iPad all these problems. You can like manage it uh, from, from your house, basically. Not every part of a field is going to have the same productivity. And this helps farmers direct limited supplies to the most productive parts. Essentially, these uh, prescription maps, which you use to differentiate your seeds, like to, to sow different rates of seeds in different parts of field, you need a prescription map. We used to create it like manually on, on our computers. It, it took us uh, from 30 to one hour for one field. Now it takes uh, one minute, maybe two, including the, like downloading this map to the monitor of the spreader. It's one way the war with Russia has accelerated change in Ukraine's farming industry. He says another is the adoption of drones. If we take our problems with the war, we used uh, helicopters for spreading chemistry on our crops because it is high and you can't uh, use a normal sprayer without uh, harming the plant. And now when the war came, we have fights uh, on some of our land, then it was deoccupied, but still aviation is forbidden there. So we started to use drones. It has less productivity than helicopters, but I think in future everything will be spreaded by drones. A drone takes more time to spray everything, but also wastes a lot less water and chemicals. Ordinary sprayer, you, you use like 100 to 200 liters per hectare. And uh, when you use a drone, you you might use uh, like 10, 20 liters per hectare, and even less, 5 liters. It's good for our water usage. It's safe to say most farmers don't have access to all these tools, especially if they didn't already have the right infrastructure and equipment on hand before the war started. And that includes the farmer we spoke to earlier. 
But there's something farmers everywhere do have, and that's a deeply held sense of purpose. Without farms, there's no food. And thanks to satellite data, we now know how much of the crops farmers were able to harvest despite being in the middle of a war. Once again, this is Inbal becker Rishef from NASA Harvest. As the season progressed, we could then look at how much was actually getting planted. And what we found was that, by and large, most fields were actually getting planted, including in the occupied territories. And so we found that around 11 or 12 percent were not were left unplanted. Those were largely concentrated in the occupied territories and particularly along the front line. It means much more land was planted with summer crops than had been expected. The other big question was how much wheat planted before the war could be harvested. And watching from the sky, she could see it was much more than what was included in those early estimates. And in fact, we found that 89% of the wheat in the occupied territories was harvested, right? What, of course, we can't answer is who's harvesting that wheat, right? So satellite data can tell us that it's being cultivated, it's being planted, it's being harvested. We can't say who is harvesting that wheat, where is that wheat ending up being stored, is it getting exported? All of that, of course, raise very important questions. Estimates for Ukraine's wheat harvest had been in the range of 20 million tons, but final numbers suggest it's almost 7 million tons higher. And she says more than 20 percent of the wheat harvest came from occupied territory, which conservatively is worth about a billion dollars, assuming it can be exported. And in the future, she thinks this type of analysis will only become more common. But she says you need local partners to do it well, so that what's done on the research side with data and machine learning makes the correct assumptions and fits with what's actually needed on the ground. Because today it's Ukraine, but tomorrow it can be any other country, right? Whether it's due to conflict or whether that's due to natural disasters or a drought or a flood. I think this is really important information that satellite data can provide, and I see us moving a lot more in that direction of being able to respond to policy needs and and requests. This episode was produced by me, Emma Silicons, and Anthony Green. It's edited by Matt Honan, mixed by Garrett Lang, with original music from Garrett Lang and Jacob Gorski. We had field production help in Ukraine from Arisia Kimyak, and special thanks this week to Max Furman, Ty Walrod, Antonio Regalado, and Megan Zarota Molino. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong. This is MIT Technology Review.